Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast, Gavin Shaw, Alex Wolf. Today we make the case is Jalen Brunson first team All NBA. Man, that, that's a good sentence to say first thing in the morning. We'll talk about it right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, what's up, guys? You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. I wanted to remind you, LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And I want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day because we are now available on all platforms that includes on YouTube. And you already know that if you see our smiling faces on a five days a week basis if you want to continue doing that be sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell to ensure you never miss an episode and then do the same on your audio podcast platform of choice by hitting that audio audio auto auto download function uh who's talking to you uh, if we know how to talk i'm gavin shell your favorite play-by-play broadcaster's favorite play-by-play broadcaster he is alex wolf editor-in-chief of the strickland the greatest next website in the whole wide world you can check them out on all forms of social media at the strick dot land and today alex after talking about one of the greatest websites in the world we talk about one of the greatest players in the world it is our firstborn son jalen Brunson um he actually I, I was thinking if he's older than me I think he's like a year younger than me so I can I can say that it's it's possible um and whether or not he is a legitimate contender for first team all NBA which is a remarkable conversation to be having um whether or not he's a top five candidate for MVP we will do that another day this a slightly different set of criteria that I actually think interestingly enough is maybe the more difficult conversation for Brunson because I, I think I think there are a lot of national people out there on board with Brunson borderline getting a fifth place MVP vote I don't know if there are as many people out there putting him on first team all NBA but we're gonna we're, we're gonna talk it out Alex the the four obvious contenders that I, I think are a step up above the rest of the league Nikola Jokic Giannis Antetokounmpo uh, Shea Gilders, Alexander, Luka Doncic. Uh, before we go any further, do do you have any issue with with those four being a uh, a step above the rest? No, I don't think so. I mean, when you look at Giannis, SGA, Luka, like they're all having such insane scoring seasons that it's like it's kind of hard to say like these guys shouldn't be up there. Like they're all averaging over thirty points per game. They have team performance to match. Like, I mean, I guess we'll see. I, I don't know. The the Bucks are. Uh, <laughs> sort of floundering a little bit as we saw the other day against the Knicks and, you know, things are looking a little weird for them. So maybe if they end up like there's a weird free fall and they end up in the fifth seat or something, which I think is still mathematically possible. They could still end up like fifth, sixth potentially seed uh, based off where they're at right now. Uh, You know, if that ends up happening, then maybe it harms the case for Giannis just a little bit. But otherwise, I mean, I, I don't, I think it's pretty tough to make a case against any of those guys. And then Jokic is Jokic. Like he's probably going to win MVP again. He's one of the most statistically insane players we've seen in the history of basketball. Um, Having one of his best years once again. So I, I don't see any way that he is not on that list. It's also worth noting, although if Jalen Brunson would make this, it would pretty much line up almost perfectly, uh, depending on how you want to classify Luca, I guess. But um the things are positionless this year. So positions don't come into play like they did in years past where it had to be two guards, two forwards and a center. Uh, Now it's just by definition, the five best players in the NBA make first team. The next five best players make second team. Next five best players make third team. Same thing with the all defensive teams, which we'll talk a little bit with uh, Isaiah Hartenstein, but I don't have any issue with those top four, Uh, which then brings us to who gets number five, because there's one more spot left for first team. Uh, We have our own Jalen Brunson on that list. And then we've identified, at least to us, the other contenders for that to be Jason Tatum, Anthony Davis, and Anthony Edwards. Yeah, and I'm going to say that after going through the exercise of looking at the the regular stats, the advanced analytics, I think we nailed it with three of the four. There, There was one... Uh, I don't want to call him a phony because I think he's he's one of my one of my favorite players I've ever watched play basketball. Um, but there's one guy who doesn't quite belong on this list, and just because we're not going to totally talk about these guys again, the the longer list would include players like Kawhi Leonard, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Demontis Sabonis, 
Devin Booker. Sabonis in particular, Alex, like I, I was just, I like, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe spoiling the second segment a little bit, but I did deep dives on the advanced numbers on all these guys and, and Sabonis should undoubtedly replace at least one person on this list because he was probably first if you had averaged on um, the five metrics I looked at together um, out of all these guys, there's just something about Sabonis. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just too far in team Julius Randall and the greatest rivalry in sports, but I don't totally buy it. I, I think part of it is the fact that he, he didn't really show up for the playoffs last year. Granted did have a broken hand. So with, with a shout out to those guys, the four that we picked were uh, of course, Jalen Brunson, Jason Tatum, best player on the best team in the NBA. Anthony Davis um, having um, maybe this side of Giannis, the best two-way season of any player in the NBA. And then uh, Anthony Edwards, who is an extraordinary talent and leading the top team in the most competitive conference in the sport. Um, so those are our four. Let's start off with Jalen. Obviously, Alex, what, what, what is the case for Jalen ultimately taking that fifth spot? So Brunson right now, if we're just looking at the counting stats, which definitely matter in terms of these awards. They're they're still highly valued by, you know, especially the the writers that, you know, aren't necessarily as analytically inclined. They're going to look at these counting stats and this is going to matter towards picking these awards. So Brunson is 28.2 points per game. Uh, that's fourth in the NBA. And he's the the top guy scoring in the 20s. Uh, the the other three, like I mentioned, uh, Giannis, SGA and Luca are all over 30 points per game. His assist numbers have gone up quite a bit. Uh, especially in this post Julius Randle world, 6.7 assists, which puts him at 12th in the NBA. So that's a solid number. 3.6 boards, 0.9 steals. He's shooting 47.7% from the field, 39.4% from three, 84.2% from the free throw line. Uh, as far as the standings go, the Knicks are obviously, I mean, we're well acquainted with the fact they're in an absolute dogfight in the East right now. Uh, they're at 46 and 32, which is technically tied for the third seed uh, just in terms of pure wins losses, but uh, slots them at the fourth seed at the moment. Thanks to the tiebreakers. As we know, they could end up as high as the second seed. They could end up as low as I think I would say reasonably the sixth seed at this point. I think there's still mathematically a chance they could be the seventh seed, but I don't think it's super likely. Um, but yeah, they, they could end up in a lot of different places. Maybe that affects how awards end up getting voted for here because there will be like a week of time from the time the regular season ends to the time that the Knicks start in the playoffs for people to then talk about like if the Knicks end up the two seed, there's going to be a lot of talk about Jalen Brunson for NBA awards and stuff because that just looks really good on paper. Um, but he's carried the load for the Knicks in a really big way since Randall went down in late January as well, which I think is probably the biggest case for him making this leap into the fifth spot here. Uh, 30.6 points per game. So if you count him starting there, he he does enter that 30 point per game club. 7.1 assists, shooting 47.5%, 34.8% from three, 85.1% on 24 shot attempts per game in 29 games since Randall got hurt. Um, and he does pretty well in, in advanced stats as well. We'll lay out some of the other ones in a minute, but the Knicks are 10.9 points better per 100 possessions with him on the floor versus off, according to basketball reference. So that is obviously very significant. And I think... To me, at least, Gavin, if we're talking just about, and this is usually more the criteria for, or the debate for MVP, more so than than for the All NBA teams, but I think it applies here too. If we're talking about who's the most valuable or necessary for their team uh, to be as good as they are, I think it's pretty hard to say that any of the guys that we're comparing him to here have uh, nearly the situation of being as relied upon as as Jalen Brunson is uh this year by the Knicks I think it it's such a it it, it kind of goes to the most improved player conversation too weirdly where you where you have to look at are all wins created equal like is it is it equally impressive to take a team from 30 to 50 wins as it is to take a team from 50 to 65 wins so that's that's the only place where it gets tricky to me when you look at someone like Jason Tatum and say all right you take Jason Tatum off the Celtics there's a Pretty decent possibility they're still the one seed in the Eastern Conference, which you could say is a, is a major indictment against him. But simultaneously, like, what is Jason Tatum supposed to do about that? Like, he's putting up 28, 7 and 7 on, on good efficiency, and he elevates the Celtics from a, a quite good team to a historically great team. Anthony Davis, um, I think the Lakers, just because of LeBron's brilliance, would still probably be about 
a 30, 35 win team? Like how much are those extra 12 wins worth in a Western conference that after the East got off to a hot start this year is clearly much better than the East. Um, Anthony Edwards, like I, I think the Timberwolves would probably have the worst offense in basketball if you just took them off that team. And 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 with him, they're they're only average on offense, but they're the top seed in the West. And they'd I don't know, they'd maybe be like probably a 41 team without Anthony Edwards. Like, so it's just tough to measure, but I think we can say pretty definitively the Knicks would be like hopeless without Jalen Brunson. Like, like do you do you think they're there are a playing team right now without Jalen Brunson? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, but probably worse than that, if yeah. I'm being honest, especially if we're just saying everything goes exactly the same this year and Julius Randle gets hurt at the same point of the season. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, I guess we would see how, how well the Ananobi, like just in this weird world where the Knicks don't have Jalen Brunson, but still make the Ananobi trade, um, <laughs> which would just be nonsense goal to, to trade Emmanuel quickly in that scenario. But you know, if, even if they made that trade and Ananobi still made the same impact they did on the team and blah, blah, blah. Like, and then Randall got hurt at the end of that month. Like, I think they're still, I mean, they're, they're not a, they might be a 31 team if that, you know, and, and I think that we can safely say that they're probably going to end up a just shy of a 50 win team this year. So I, I think Brunson reasonably this year is worth almost, almost 15 to 20 wins for this team. Yeah. Like, and I don't think that's, that's exaggerating because they just rely on him so much night in night out especially in the post julius randall world to just create i was gonna say real real quick alex third in the nba in points per game since randall went down yeah yeah which is which is especially impressive when you consider who the competition is which we already laid out like mm -hmm. that's competing against the guys that we think are are the locks um but let's i i think we can make a little more of a case for some of these other guys uh for tatum for davis for edwards and then get into some of the advanced stats uh, so let's do that in just a second when we get back in. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. So I can only speak from the being hired perspective, but I can say that LinkedIn is unique in the sense that it's not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. So on my end of that, I think it is the sheer volume that ultimately separates LinkedIn at the end of the day. I worked at the NFL years and years and years ago, and yet a, a, a coworker of a coworker, someone I never even met during my time there, led to me getting an opportunity with CBS Sports for a dream position, got to travel, all expenses paid. It was, it was an all-timer so, so much fun. And it was all thanks to LinkedIn. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire, but that's why they're constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, let's uh, let, let's go one by one, Alex, and 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 make the case for these guys. So, Jalen Brunson, uh, you said it. Uh, the statistical resume is extraordinary since the start of January. Just under thirty-one points per game, seven assists, forty-seven and a half percent from the field, thirty-five percent from three, eighty-five percent of the line, and it, from the line, excuse me. Even though he's not hit the efficiency markers, he was hitting the first two or three months of the season where he was hovering around forty percent from three on high volume. The fact that as a like smaller player that like he has just survived the workload and done so while still being hyper efficient from two point range while continuing to get to the line and make his free throws while continuing to come up big in uh, against the best teams in the biggest moments. Like I, I just don't think any other player on this list has had as difficult of a task this season. And, and and to me, like if you're, if you're ultimately at the end of the day, going to sit here and say, Hey, I think out of this group, Brunson deserves it. You could say Tatum plays with four other guys who in, in another year would have had strong all-star cases. Anthony Davis, um, you, you wrote this down. It's questionable if he's even the top candidate from his own team where LeBron is still so clearly at the end of the day, 
um, the engine of that offense. And when LeBron's off the floor, Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell are the guys most often like initiating offense at the very least. It doesn't really run through Davis. He's not the same jump shooter he is. Edwards is maybe the closest fast simile to Brunson, except he has Carl Anthony Towns and has certainly had him for a longer portion of the season um, than Jalen Brunson did, though we could say what Edwards has done since Towns went down 16 games ago. Maybe the closest analog to what Brunson's had to do for the second half of the year. But I, I think at the end of the day, th there's just no one who is carrying as heavy of an offensive burden. I, I think maybe the simplest way to say it, like there's no one who's had as good of an offensive season as Jalen Brunson has had on this list. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the just the like historic, you know, benchmarks and stuff too, like he's had a 60 point game this year, like those things are things that stick in voters' minds, certainly. Um, you know, I think that I think Brunson is finally starting to kind of break into the mainstream a bit. Like, I think last year, for as good of a year as he had, I mean, obviously we saw, I don't want to harp on this too much because everybody in Knicks fans certainly have had their fun with it, but we've even seen, you know, like partway through this year, like Candace Parker, you know, still miscategorizing, like, Hey, you know, he had a bad second round, even though he had, he averaged like 32 points per game against the heat in the second round of the playoffs last year. And I think that like with the two 50 plus point games and, and all this stuff, I think Brunson is finally starting to kind of crack the, the national discourse a little bit uh, more so than he had before, especially because people are starting to recognize just how good he's been with Randall out. I think that's like, I don't know. I, you know, we keep coming back to it, but if I was going to keep Tatum off, I mean, he's, he's seventh in the NBA in scoring. Like his other numbers are all fantastic. Like, you know, eight boards, five assists. Like that's a very complete stat line. Uh, shoots 47% overall, 38% from three, 83% from the line. Like that's all awesome. Obviously his team is by far the best, but I just can't get away from with him. Like how much of that 62 wins can you attribute to him? Like, I think the Celtics are still at least a 50 win team without him, which would still put them at the number one seed right now. Um, you know, cause they're just so far and away better than every other team in the East right now that like the second seed probably won't have 50 wins, uh, or there's a decent chance they won't, um, or they might just barely crack 50, you know, in these last few games of the season. So, you know, it's, I think that to me, I just, I can't give it to him. Like, I, and there's nothing wrong with getting, you know, the first spot on the second team, but I just think the first team to me should be reserved for like someone who's truly like relied upon by their team to make them great. Uh, which I just think is not the case for better or worse for Tatum, you know, props to uh, Brad Stevens for putting together a really awesome team, but it just kind of lessens the impact of what Tatum brings to the floor. And then I, I do keep coming back to like the thing with Davis, you know, he's so impressive on both ends of the floor and like, it's been so huge for what the Lakers have been able to accomplish, but LeBron has been healthy for most of this year, too. Like, LeBron has played 68 games this year. And, you know, I, I give Davis props for playing 74, which is, like, crazy for him. I mean, this guy's averaged 44 games played per season for the last three seasons, and that's been, like, the biggest issue with him is he can't stay healthy. So he deserves to be rewarded for that in some ways, but he plays with LeBron James. It's like, you know, it's like trying to make a case for – Oh, should Scottie Pippen be an all NBA first team with a great statistical profile? Oh, but by the way, he plays with Michael Jordan. You know, it's like, I don't know, maybe, but maybe they should just both be all NBA. Maybe LeBron should be first team all NBA. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's almost a case for that. Like, if you look at his uh, numbers, you know, LeBron is more impactful by plus minus and, um, you know, and, and by on off numbers and stuff like that. Like, maybe LeBron is just the guy that should be it. Uh, even though AD is the more dependable, like two way force on that team. And then Edwards, I just kind of come back to like with him. I'm like, I don't know. I, I find his statistical case to be pretty compelling, but I look at him versus like a Brunson and I just kind of say like, yes, he's more exciting as a player. Yes. He has like the highlight dunks and he'll, you know, end someone's life that way. And, you know, yes, he has the, you know, the the big like Dwayne Wade, LeBron style, like blocks, you know, sometimes and the the crazy feats of athleticism that really catch your eye more than a Jalen Brunson. But, you know, yeah, to your point, I, I think he just had a better team around him, too, you know, and had Cat for more of this season prior to losing him to injury, um, you know, and all in all is he's the engine for his team, much like how Brunson is. But I just don't know if he has been forced through this year to 
bear quite as much the brunt as Jalen Brunson has. And I think that deserves to be rewarded in these all NBA proceedings. So like to me, I, and maybe you want to lay out the advanced stat case real quick and where everybody stands there, but that's sort of where I'm leaning and it's probably me being a homer, but that's sort of like my thought process as I've started sort of creeping Brunson into that fifth spot over some of these guys. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll run through it as, as quickly as I can. I, I just pulled up like for the most commonly used metrics. Um, you can, you can go to basketball reference or, or NBA.com and get a definition for all of these and, and where they're separated, but basically they're, they're, they're all in one metrics. Um, uh, value of a replacement player, Vorp, Brunson 7th, Davis ninth, Tatum 10th, Edwards 17th, Wind shares, Davis 6th, Brunson 8th, Tatum 9th. Uh, I just threw this in because it's fun. Isaiah Hartenstein 25th, <laughs> Anthony Edwards 32nd, Box plus minus. I like this one because it has the clear-cut top four MVP candidates as its top four. Um, so if you want to put more weight there, Brunson's 9th, Davis is 13th, Tatum's 14th, Dante DiVincenzo 23rd, Anthony Edwards 28th. I'm, I'm slipping these in to, to say Ant should not necessarily be part of this conversation. Um, player impact estimate, which is a new one for from NBA.com, pretty equivalent to real plus minus. Anthony Davis is seventh, Tatum's 12th, Brunson's 15th, Ant is 21st. All that averages out to uh, Davis as having the best case, 8.75, Brunson 9.75, Tatum 11.25, and 24.5. I didn't do this for Leonard, James, Durant, Sabonis. I think Sabonis might actually rank the highest out of these groups in those stats. Um, my my like all-in-one conclusion for each guy, like Tatum, best player and best team. Anthony Davis, best two-way force. Brunson, best offensive player and easiest, easily the heaviest load of any of the four. And highest ceiling of the group, but a year or two away from hitting a level where he should really be part of this conversation, even if you have the caveat comparing him to Brunson offensively, that Anthony Edwards is in a different universe as a defensive player. So my final rankings that I, I don't, I don't feel great about Alex because you you almost you made me want to switch just to put Brunson first, but just for the sake of variety, I'm gonna have Anthony Davis in first just because he like he is the Lakers defense like by himself. Like that team does not consistently employ like another clear cut plus defender. LeBron in the playoffs is that in the regular season, Jib maybe just off of reputation is that, but LeBron does not really play that side of the ball on, on a minute to minute basis anymore. Their backcourt is a disaster on that end. And I think Davis just, just glues that team that is now just one win behind the Knicks a, a playing a tougher schedule together, pretty much single-handedly while still being an excellent offensive player. And I think Jalen Brunson for as good as he is, if the Knicks did not have stalwarts at center, like they would fall apart a little bit and you can just as easily make the case. All right. If Davis did not have, Creators on offense, they would fall apart a little bit despite his defense. So I, I'm okay flip flopping that. I I just I, I think the the slight edge in the advanced numbers gives me the cushion to put Davis first, Brunson second, Tatum third, which I also don't feel good about because I was just starting a team with one of these guys. I might take Tatum first out of this group. Um, I, I'm I'm slipping in Kawhi fourth just because that's how fraudulent the advanced numbers paint Anthony Edwards. I think Kawhi's had an awesome season. We just didn't have him on our initial list. Um, and then Anthony Edwards, uh, fifth for me. But but what's your list, Alex? Yeah, I've got Brunson number one, if it's not obvious enough. Um, mm -hmm. I'm putting him in there. Probably a homer take. I don't care. Uh, I've never been afraid to do it before, and I'll do yeah. it again. Damn it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I've got Brunson in there. I just think I think the case for him is so heavily on based on the fact that this team has played as well as they have without Julius Randle. Mm -hmm. And that's just a testament to Jalen Brunson. And I think that he's been, he stepped up in a huge way. Like he increased every one of his numbers. He only took a, a small dip to efficiency. It feels like he's not making a lot of threes sometimes, yet he's still shooting 35% on really high volume right now since Julius Randle got hurt, which is very necessary for this team. But on top of that, just like the fact that he does so many things that defy convention, like his, his just skill of the game, like, like, being one of the higher post scorers in the NBA at his height and his position is crazy. Uh, the fact that he's as good as he is like in close and everything. I don't know. There's just something maybe we're spoiled by seeing him every day and appreciate this more, but like there's something special about the way that he plays the game. Uh, but on top of it, you know, the stats match, I think his impact matches, you know, I, I just think that that gives him the, the nod here. I have Davis second, you know, I think, there's something to be said for rewarding someone who's that much of a two-way force for their team. Um, and, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm half tempted to, you know, make the case for LeBron, but I'm pushing LeBron a little lower. I think that voters in this case, you know, people are narrative voters. So I think the narrative has shifted this year to AD being the most valuable player on that team. 
I know that that's going to end up being the case, uh, you know, when it comes to voting and LeBron will still make a second or third team all NBA, but AD will, you know, finish higher in the voting than him. I think I got Tatum third, just cause again, you know, I think the team thing hurts him a bit. Um, I think he's solidly second team all NBA, but I just can't see him being first team when it's like, you can't, you have to just take the team thing out for him. I, in my opinion, because his team is so good. Uh, so the team performance aspect just doesn't really carry weight for me. Then I've got Anthony Edwards and then I got LeBron. I mean, I don't know. At that point, you're kind of just like, just fill out the second and third team rosters. You know, <laughs> like the, there's plenty of other good candidates too that we mentioned. You know, there's Sabonis and uh, Kawhi and, you know, guys like that. Um, you know, Durant, you know, which, I mean, they've had their struggles in Phoenix. So maybe that's a little tougher of a, of a sell. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's really tight, but I do think I could give Brunson the edge there. Uh, another guy we're going to make a case for is Dante DiVincenzo um, as as far as the uh, most improved <laughs> player goes, which the more I looked at it, the more I feel like maybe he's got a case. And we're going to talk about if we think Isaiah Hartenstein can make all defense in just a sec. But first, I got to let you know about our friends over at Game Time. And Game Time is now the authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. For the Mets fans, it's, uh, they go down throughout the season, too. I, I can already see the, the downward trend. It's great. I'll be able to go to a baseball game for like a dollar pretty soon. Uh, with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. And you know, I I'd love to attend some Mets games this year. I you know, they're not very good on the field. I had a feeling they wouldn't be, but the food is great. And what's great is that if I use Game Time and get those low prices with that low price guarantee, I could save more money for the really good food at City Field. So that's my plan this year. I will definitely be on Game Time quite a bit. Probably going to a lot of last-minute weeknight Mets games because the prices are already uh, plummeting and will only continue to do so. At this rate, I think by June, I will legitimately be able to get a seat to a game for $5, uh, which sounds pretty awesome. And there's a lot of great things that you can get on the Game Time app you can't get anywhere else, like last-minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last-minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Uh, you get flash deals. You can save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. You can get zone deals. You can save even more when you choose a section and let game time choose the seats. Pretty cool stuff there. And you get all-in pricing. This is the most important thing. You can toggle this feature, which shows your total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. Nobody likes those surprise fees, so definitely turn that feature on. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, and we're back in to keep talking through. We've determined Jalen Brunson is. Uh, the undisputed fifth uh, All NBA first team guy. Well, um, I, I I disputed it. I disputed. It. <laughs> I, nope, nope. I didn't hear that. All I heard oh, was that Jalen Brunson is the fifth I, my guy. My mic must have been unplugged. Sorry. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, that's all I heard. So now we're gonna make the case that Dante <laughs> you just you just like bleep me saying like Anthony Davis yeah. is their full full bleep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're yeah. gonna you're gonna. Say I, I think ah, it's, it's <laughs> Just warble it or like yeah, AI yeah, yeah. fake you yeah. saying Jalen Brunson. You cut me, cut it in from another episode. Jalen Brunson. <laughs> Jalen Brunson. <laughs> Anthony Davis sucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but let's talk about Dante DiVincenzo. Uh, you know, we were trying to come up with other guys that maybe have cases for all NBA awards or you know, NBA wide awards, I should say, on the Knicks going into this episode. And my initial thought was, eh, I don't think anyone has a case. And then the more I looked at it, I was like. Dante DiVincenzo might have a case for most improved player. Now, I don't think he'll win it, but I think he should maybe at least get some votes, maybe some third place votes or something, second place votes. I don't know. We'll get into some betting line odd favorites in a second uh, for, you know, who could potentially win most improved player in a second. And, you know, the guys that are kind of considered like by sports books to be like the, the leading candidates right now. Um, but 
as far as Dante's concerned, I, I think he's got a case. I don't know. Like, so his career prior to this year, 9.1 points per game, 4.6 rebounds per game, 2.8 assists per game, 1.2 steals per game. And then he shot 42%, 36% from three and 77.7% lucky number seven uh, from the free throw line to this point in his career this year. 15.4 points per game. So he's got like a six, almost six and a half point swing there uh, in his points per game. And then 3.6 boards. So a little down in that category, but he plays with Josh Hart. So not surprising. Uh, 2.6 assists right there with his career average. 1.3 steals right there with his career average. But shooting 44% from the field, which is up. 40% from three, which is very much up. And 75% from the free throw line. We obviously know already that he's, set the Knicks single season three point record and counting, which is impressive as well. Um, and is one of the top three point scores in the entire NBA. So I don't know, Gavin, I mean, I know you want to highlight to the, the big stretch that he had with Brunson out, but like, I think he's made a pretty compelling case for himself as potentially the most improved player this year. Yeah. I, I think most improved players is one of those awards that is just so totally in the I have the beholder. I was I was hinting at it a little bit earlier, but like, is it more impressive for a player to go from good to great than than average to good? Is, is it impressive when a rookie makes a huge leap his second year? Um, a lot of people say no, but then all right, is it crazy if he makes a huge leap from second to third year? So it, it's 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 as much as any award is inherently subjective. I think most improved is is, is maybe the single most subjective is the criteria is it, so fickle and hard to pin down. Um, that being said, when I think about it, I try to focus in on like a specific skill leap. Like, 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 did your role just get bigger, like a Tyrese Maxey, because James Harden left and you always had this ability? Or did you like actually dramatically improve one capacity of your game in the offseason? And Sixers fans, I'm not saying that Maxey didn't. Just an example. Um, Dante DiVincenzo undoubtedly became a dramatically better three point shooter. You look at the percentages and you say, all right, he was 39.7 last year. He's down to 40.5 after a little bit of a late season swoon. Like, is that that different? I'm going to say yes. He took about five per game last year. He's taking just under nine per game this year. That doubling in three point volume while not only maintaining efficiency, but increasing efficiency is fairly extraordinary. Um, and, and, and the fact that he's not doing it in the, in the context of the Warriors who have an ability to generate open threes for players, not named Steph Curry and Clay Thompson in a way that just no other team has had access to in, in, in the modern NBA or, or essentially in NBA history. So, um, the, the load on him is just completely different. And instead of faltering, like he has just gotten more efficient and better, um, in terms of his ability at the rim and his ability to create his own shot, he's never shown this much, this consistently, and, and and similar to Jalen Brunson with Julius Randle going down, he for long stretches has become the de facto second option on this team. When on the Warriors last year, what was he like the fifth, sixth option on the Bucks, fifth, sixth option, Kings, fifth, sixth option? Like that is just a dramatic leap. Do I think he will win it at the end of the day? No. Do I think he should? Probably not. Someone like Maxi, like a, like maybe is a slightly better case, but he should be on some ballots. I'll say that much. Yeah, and so let's let's go over the. The betting favorites uh, seems to be pretty much universally. These are the guys uh, considered to be, you know, the, the front runners for the award. Uh, and maybe we can then just kind of try to slot Dante in somewhere in there uh, and see if he fits somewhere. But Tyrese Maxey, six point per game leap this year. He was an all star, uh, three assists per game leap. Obviously had to carry a large responsibility when Joel Embiid was out for the Sixers and try to keep them afloat to mixed results. But uh, he certainly did his best. Uh, so, I mean, but he's he's gone from good to great player to all-star this year, which, you know, is usually one of the criteria for, for this award to, you know, kind of make that leap. Cam Thomas, if you want to just talk pure statistical gains, 12-point-per-game leap, uh, which is crazy, but also got double the playing time. So it's like, you know, whatever there. But, I mean, averaging over 20 points per game, which is impressive. Uh you know, regardless. So, you know, take that for whatever you will, but obviously playing on not a very good team on the nets. So that maybe carries some weight. Scotty Barnes is, has been the next, uh, next best betting favorite five point per game leap this year, one assist per game leap, uh, almost a stock per game more. I guess this is maybe just based on him having the shoulder more load with the, the Raptors sort of blowing things up, but the Raptors been bad, like very bad as a team. So certainly the team, the team success aspect is not in his favor at all yeah, in that big, regard. Big leap is a shooter too. I think that's the other thing with him. That's true. That's true. So, I mean, 
maybe that's what you're what you count it towards. Uh, then you got Alper and Shangun uh, with the Rockets. I think he's got more of a compelling case than Scotty Barnes. Like six point per game leap, one assist per game more, but his team got a lot better and he he became like the best player on his team, um, which is crazy. So, I, I, you know, for a team that was a perennial lottery team for years uh, to then make the leap that they did had a lot to do with him having the season that he did. So uh, I think, you know, maybe you can make a pretty strong case for him to be a little higher on the list. Shaden Sharp, second year players. So I feel like that always works against players, but six point per game leap, almost two assists per game leap on a really bad team though. Again, so it's like he's just getting a ton of playing time. So how much of that is attributed to that? And then Kate Cunningham, I'm, sure, I'm going to go out and say right now, Dante DiVincenzo should absolutely at minimum be higher than Kate Cunningham as far as a betting odds favorite for most improved player because he's he's gotten better by three points per game, uh, an assist and a half per game. But like the team is terrible and he's a number one overall pick. Like, shouldn't he be getting shouldn't he be getting incre like that's incremental? Yeah, he, he can't be. No, no, no. Piston can win an award this year. I no, think. no. Piston should even be like listed on anything for any awards this year. So I I would take him off the ballot automatically. I'm saying Dante should be higher than him. But should he be higher? Than, I think he should also be higher than Shaden Sharp. Yeah. And I, I think mean, Shaden Sharp won. played like half the season. Like I'm, I'm surprised he is it not 65 games for, um, most maybe, of the group. I guess, I guess not. It's not. I don't know. Maybe that yeah. maybe the the odds I was looking at were slightly dated too. I did pull this up slightly rushed, but he was listed uh, mm -hmm. on the article that I found. So I don't know. But uh, if we're talking about some of the other guys, I don't know. I I think I would maybe arguably slot him in higher than Scotty Barnes and put him behind like Maxi, who's the obvious winner, and Cam Thomas, who's just the crazy statistical profile guy yeah i'm good i'm good with that i mean i even like cam thomas is a tough one just because it's been like like what are what are the value of those points versus mm -hmm. what dante's doing and i think if we if we scoured the rest of the league maybe maybe even some other knicks uh someone like isaiah hartenstein like you could make a better case but i i I, th I think maxi maxi's the winner dante again should maybe be on some ballots um but this is to your point, like it, it's so predicated on like, all right, did you score more this year? Like that's, that's what it comes down to a lot of the time. So um, probably not going to win at the end of the day. All right, let, let's do this real quick because we're running low on time. Can Isaiah Hartenstein make all defense? He's played 72 games. He's started 46 games. Um, you laid out the stats, Alex, 8.3 rebounds, 2.3 stocks per game. He's had a wildly good analytics season. He's top 10 in the entire NBA in net rating. He's 21st in the league in defensive win shares. And that's despite not starting 26 games and playing hurt through approximately the last 20 or so. So in terms of impact at his peak, there's like this kind of a dark horse case to be made there. I, I just think at the end of the day, like there's just too many great big man defenders. And if you want to look at it like this, like there's like, there's a pretty compelling argument to me that he's not the best defensive center on his own team. Um, that, that would be a fun full episode we could do at some point, but the way Mitchell Robinson was playing this year, I think that was more worthy of the level of an all defensive team. Hartenstein, I think tops out as very good on that end of the floor, but not like the truly transcendent impact of someone like when who's seemingly blocking five shots per game since the all-star break, a uh, Rudy Gobert, who's leading the best defense in basketball. And then even guys like Pam Adebayo and Anthony Davis, who are obviously mainstays, but just a bit more versatile and, and, and just ultimately a bit more intimidating at the basket than Hartenstein is as good as he is. Yeah, I pulled up a recent article from The Athletic where they were trying to, like, pick the the All-NBA and All-Defensive teams. And so, like, here's some of the names that are showing up, like, first and second team from some of their writers. Rudy Gobert, Lou Dort, Bam Adebayo, Victor Weminyama, Jalen Suggs, uh, Drew Holiday, Jaden McDaniels, Jared Allen, Herb Jones, Anthony Davis. Um, and then Derek White shows up sometimes. Alex Caruso. I mean, there's, there's a pretty interesting list of guys this year like like it is interesting to see someone like a caruso pop up because you go well team wise the, his team is not very great overall um so it's like how do you weigh that um when you're you know doing awards like that i i would i would struggle to probably put hartenstein in here too i think the biggest thing that would harm him in awards voting is the fact that he didn't start the whole season maybe much like Brunson, the fact that he stepped up as big as he did when Mitchell Robinson went down starts to, you know, help his case uh, more so than harm it. You know, if you're just looking at the pure, like he started 
you know, whatever it was, 40 some odd games um, this year versus like the almost 30 that he or yeah, 46 started 72 games played. So like almost played 30 games before he, you know, started starting uh, after Mitch went down. Maybe that hurts him if you're just looking at it like that. But then if you look at it like well, he led the uh, eighth best defense in net rating uh, this year on the Knicks, you know, and did that despite the guy that was supposed to be the defensive stalwart going down ahead of him. Maybe that helps his case. Uh, he's also a plus 11.1 per 100 uh, with him out there, which is actually better than Jalen Brunson, which is pretty crazy. Uh, so maybe there's a case. I think, you know, considering it's positionless and you can have more than two centers on the list, I think we're going to see a lot of centers <laughs> make the uh, all defensive teams because they are, you know, regardless of if the center is getting sort of sort of phased out uh, as far as their overall importance, you know, in the last 15 years or so in the NBA, their defensive importance, I don't think has ever been higher because so often now we see centers that are just tasked with being, 80% of the defense, you know, and being the the safety net that keeps everybody else uh, from drowning. So he definitely fills that role for the Knicks. I think he comes up just short, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but it makes a, a very compelling case based off how well he's played uh, since Mitchell Robinson went down. And the fact that he played well enough to hold that job and is still just as impactful right now as he was then and doesn't, you know, Mitch is having some some good performances since he got back but we're not sitting here being like mitch needs to start over hartenstein or anything i think that speaks pretty well for for uh hartenstein there look i'll, I'll end the podcast by saying this um isaiah hartenstein and dante divincenzo uh both better players than anthony edwards according to one hand-picked uh, advanced analytic and and hopefully that uh lets people listening uh allow me to keep my nicks homer card despite uh picking uh uh, uh, omitted. Um, we'll wrap up on that. He's Alex. I'm Gavin. Uh, we'll be back for you tomorrow morning uh, with a recap of that Bulls game. Until then, we'll talk to you very, very soon on Locked on Knicks.